And that's part of, you know, my good morning rituals that I share and um, my practice, my pillar that I keep coming back to so that um, I can tell when I'm, you know, been entered with or like feeling into other people's energy and like what's mine, what's theirs. And then using these practices to maintain that energetic sovereignty is like my home base. And so this is a lot of what I teach with my clients so that that can become their home base. And then with that, it's really beautiful to witness because then they're starting to source answers for themselves. And then they're starting to like choose their path more wisely on their own. We're here in Austin, Texas. I'm with my really best friend now. Going to be my best friend here in Austin, one of them, uh, the one and only Charles Clay. Charles, welcome back to Wellness Force, man. Yes. Welcome back to the show. When did we do our last podcast? In the Dome in Encinitas. Yeah, it was uh, well over a year ago. Man, it seems like yeah. just yesterday. You've become a father. <laughs> a and, lot's happened. And uh, you got married and your coaching practice has deepened. The way you serve people has deepened. And I got to tell you straight up, man, to start this conversation, let's just begin right here. You have the most calm demeanor. You are like super chill mode at all times, yet you deal with the same responsibilities that we all deal with. Mm -hmm. For people that don't know Charles, two, two-fold question. Uh, how do you maintain that center, which is probably a lot of what we're going to discuss today? Mm -hmm. And then also, like, who is Charles Clay today, mm -hmm. right here in the end of October, on your father's birthday, actually, which is even more special. Mm -hmm. Those two questions, man. The inner peace, <laughs> the inner peace, and also, um, uh, who are you to the world? You know, the digital world, and also mm -hmm. uh, the physical world. Who's Charles Clay? Yeah. Ah, beautiful questions. Where to begin? Um, first, inner peace, calm, is our natural state. It's it's home base for me, and I believe all of us. And so. Um, just remembering that allows us to always touch home, you know, and even in the midst of the craziest chaos and storms, I'm, I'm throwing curveballs left and right in life, you know, especially as a father yeah. now. And, um, so it's not like I just don't experience that. It's, it's the way in which I experience it that I choose wisely. And, um, we'll get to dive in on that. Yeah. There's today. a lot of, of <laughs> tactical things that. Charles is like really world-class at, you know, getting people to their core so they can operate with abundance and ease instead of like this tension and fear that so many people are trapped up in. Right. And, um, one of the cool things that I've gotten to witness is like how you interact with your child, which is amazing. And I, I say that that word gets thrown around amazing, but it takes a really like embodied human to be strong in their business, embodied man, for sure. Strong in their business, strong in their relationship strong with their family and strong with their wealth and their, their finances. But the learning curve has been steep at times, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, just like for all of us, man, um, out, out of those four, like which one of those can we, can we start with first? Which one of those have you received the most lessons in contrast with? Um, out of those four, well, first I'm still tuning to the, the compliment with my uh, sweet little daughter, Sophia. I'm just tuning into that. Like, <clears throat> Just to back up, that has been that has been by far the biggest initiation, the biggest joy, the biggest honor of my life so far. And um, so, literally, just like waking up with her every morning and seeing this cute little face that's just so adorable, and like, like <clears throat> it's interesting looking back, thinking you know, being a, a single bachelor for a while, but also been called to doing this deep inner work, you know, having an understanding of what love is, right? And then this initiation of fatherhood just completely blows that 
expands that exponentially to new levels of love that I didn't realize were possible with this little being in my life. So that's been um, just a huge blessing. And uh, so I appreciate that compliment and wanted to tune yeah. into that first. You're so welcome. <laughs> You're so welcome. Yeah, these these categories of like uh, unique expansion and struggle, it doesn't always have to be struggle. And I feel like on social media, we have like, and they're, they're well-meaning people like Gary Vaynerchuk and Ed Milet and all these people that are like, you know, uh, honor the struggle, make sure that you're like enjoying the struggle. I think it's one thing to hear that or read that on social media. I think it's totally different to actually embody the enjoyment of the struggle. Right. right. And let's face it, man, we can talk to the everyday human right now, or we can talk to the coach, the facilitator, the health practitioner, no matter who they are. Um, there's those categories we talked about, but there's also just like this awareness, you know, an awareness of what is, you know, before you even get into like, who am I in those categories, the awareness process. Do you have a process for yourself? Um, and has that process changed since you've been a dad? Like, do you get that awareness practice in first thing in the morning or in the afternoon? Yeah. Cause awareness, you know, awareness leads us to everything else we'll talk about. If right. you don't have awareness, you really don't have much. Absolutely. Yeah, my pillar has always been um, these deep-rooted practices that I've gained, you know, through my experiences and teachers and, and intuition that, um, you know, I can, <clears throat> I have an entire hour-long good morning ritual that I offer to our community, the High Vibe Tribe, every Monday. It's super fun. It's a deep dive into breath work, movement to release resistance in the body and, and meditation to really ground and drop in. And then I have like the condensed, okay, I'm a father and now I need to do this in five minutes version, <laughs> you know, or, or while I'm, you know, going about my day, like ways to incorporate that into so that, so that life becomes a meditation instead of just like, oh, I got to get my 10 minutes of meditation in every day and then I'm good. Right. Well, the honey the reason, list. Yeah. The reason we do that 10 minutes of meditation is so that you can experience that, continue to perpetuate that level of peace and, and understanding and awareness throughout the rest of our day. So, why not incorporate that and have those like milestones, those key like pillars that um, I can always come back to when I feel like I'm getting thrown out of alignment or, you know, getting thrown some curveballs in life and, and the going gets tough. And it's like, man, cool, time to come back to what works and how I remember to tune in to what's real, what's most important, um, what, what I clearly need to focus on right now most and put all my presence into that one thing at a time. And um, so that's, that's my, uh, you know, cliff notes on how I come back to that place each time. And then, um, man, there's so many tools and amazing you know, gifts and biohacking techniques to, to feel good and to like, you know, try to feel better. But really what shifted for me was, you know, cause I would had this, um, deep kind of underlying level of anxiety, which I could adapt to easily, you know, years ago. And, and, um, so I just kind of like grew accustomed to it almost. And, and, and then it would get triggered and aggravated by certain things. And so <clears throat> that I tried was, it was almost like it was annoying. So I tried everything, right? I tried reading the books and doing the self-development and like, um, I tried running from it and exercising, right? To beat anxiety. And that actually helped temporarily, um, cause it's moving energy. However, <clears throat> none of these things, you know, I tried stuffing it with food or escaping from it on Netflix or social media and all these things. Right. But it was still like this underlying feeling of anxiety would continue to show up and it would get intensified the more I tried to run from it or escape from it or, you know, just come back. And so <clears throat> trying all these different things that didn't work, trying to feel better, trying to use positivity, you know, and everything's light and, and bliss. Good and, vibes only. <laughs> yeah. Good vibes you only. You know, that, yeah. that's great. And it's like limiting the spectrum of emotions that I, that I could experience. Um, it was kind of like hitting a glass ceiling of the level of joy I could experience too and bliss and pleasure on the other end because I wasn't willing to go to the depths of the heavy emotions and the anxiety yet. And so literally everything shifted for me. One day I was like, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to invite anxiety in for tea. Like I'm not going to avoid it anymore. I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going to stuff it. I'm just going to invite it in for tea 
it's let's call it what it is it's energy right so we get the the charge from the word anxiety oftentimes can even just bring a jolt or contraction in our system yeah but if we just call it what it is it's energy so why not seek to understand like set the intention i really want to understand why this energy is here and what can i learn from it and that really opened up um a new realm for me. That's spiritual and, maturity, emotional maturity. Yeah. But but how old were you when that occurred? When you invited it in for tea? Yeah. So this was a good eight years ago. Yeah. And um and so that helped me shift everything. Instead of trying to always feel better, I was allowing myself to just feel more. And that was a huge shift because in doing that, I began to have the courage to go deeper into the depths of heavy emotions that I was avoiding with alcohol, drugs, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you name yeah, it, right? Yeah. Anything to not feel these heavy emotions, right? Those things are fun <laughs> if they're done with intention occasionally <laughs> right. and, you know, with the right heart space. Right. And, yeah. and yet, um, some of those patterns became more addictive, you know, and I definitely like, you know, hit some, some rock bottoms where I was like, okay this relationship with these external substances has gotten out of hand and I need to change this. And then I went to do that and like set a commitment, you know, New Year's resolution, I'm going to go, you know, cut out alcohol and, and smoking weed and all these things. And yet I'd make it like a month, you know, and then go back to the old patterns. And so in doing that, I was literally chipping away at my own integrity and my own self-trust and my own confidence every time I didn't hold that agreement with myself. And so um, that that was a huge uh, realization that, that wasn't fun to sit with. And so as I began to improve my emotional intelligence, I realized that, wow, having the courage to go to the depths of these emotions, I'm actually learning why I crave these substances in the first place. And then when I begin to witness through this process, as that energy begins to finally metabolize in my system, then there's not the same energetic like magnetism to the alcohol or to the pleasure seeking or, you know, as much need to go on social media and do all these um, external things to try to fill it. Right. So that was a huge um epiphany for me it was like wow i'm on to something here because that literally helped me step into creator consciousness over consuming let's pause right there because yeah. you just unpacked a ton and there's there's two things that that hit me really hard the first one is that you talked about the clean slate and like the new year's you know in my opinion uh, let's extrapolate i don't think that the clean slate actually exists i think the clean slate is an illusion I think we are imperfect beings on purpose. And anytime I try to go like hardcore right, hardcore left, you know, I'm not drinking ever again, or I'm not going to do this ever again. I'm going to be perfect in this way. Eventually we're going to come back to the middle, right? Yeah. Cause in the middle you can observe and you talked about like the creator consciousness and what was the other one you mentioned? Um, over consuming. The you consuming know, we... consciousness. So dude, talk about the clean slate and then, and then mm -hmm. please pull that into the creator versus the consumer. Absolutely. So, so this is, like square one and a lot of the coaching I provide is that let's set ourselves up for wins since we know that every time we make these agreements, even if it's to stop texting and driving for a month or whatever, right? But every time we catch ourselves texting I get and to driving, do I get to do I get to do that. It's like yeah. boom, chipping away at that integrity. And I realize like I would always hold my word when it was with other people. Mm -hmm. If I say I'm gonna show up, I'll show up and I'll help you and support and whatever. But whenever I was making these agreements with myself, I was slipping. Big time. And then when I went to go do big things, self-doubt was like this really loud voice that would kind of like want to stuff me back in my cave, man cave, and deal with my stuff before I came out again and could like actually step into creating something amazing. So that was what I found um, the opposite is true. And, and that's what I help people with is setting yourself up for wins. So it's like, man, if you if you notice that you're, your relationship with sugar is not very good and not serving you right now. Start with a day or half a day. Yeah. I'm going to take today off from sugar. Right. And then notice as you go through that journey, 
how many times you want sugar, notice the emotions and the energy that comes up because there's, there's a reason that you crave that, right? And that's the self-discovery that you can choose every time and create a new neural pathway instead of continuing to choose the external, you know, pharmacy, sugar, dopamine, whatever you're getting your fix from, um, that's, that's causing, that's perpetuating the pattern that keeps showing up. Right. And so by doing that, you get a quick win all of a sudden, woo, I did it. I went a day without sugar. All right. Now I'm building momentum. So now what's my next agreement, you know? And so what's really important about that process that a lot of people forget and in life too, is that celebrate those victories. Even if it's one day without sugar, what's a healthy way to celebrate that? What's a healthy way to, you know, dance and like do some cartwheels, something silly that allows you to reinforce that neural pathway. And then you're connecting and accessing those neurotransmitters, the feel good hormones that you were seeking from the sugar in the first place. Um, and every time you reward that yourself, you're um, increasing that self-trust, increasing that confidence, increasing your integrity. And then when you go to do something great, you know, write that book or go on stage, share your message, do a video, self-doubt can finally take a back seat. It's like, it's, it's quieter because you know you have the self-trust to actually show up for it. I feel like mm -hmm. self-doubt is um, really a protector and, and just bear with me because I want to jam with you on this. I feel like the protector archetype, whether it's shopping, food, sex, porn, drugs, I mean, you fill in the blank. It's just anything that disassociates you from self, mm -hmm. right? Any of those things. Totally. Um, and that's the voice you had mentioned when people try to change an eating habit or whatever it is. The protector is there really to force us through contrast to the celebration moments, the good feelings, the serotonin and all this stuff. But what is it about like the really octopus tail? sometimes for so many people of the protector that pulls them into the dark. Mm -hmm. Like what is that on a psychological <laughs> level? Um, not that knowing what it is will somehow make it go away, mm -hmm. but for people that are analytical, it might calm their analytical mind to know what that is. Sure. So I can share my personal experience first and then a broader perspective on it. Yeah. But um, the even simply naming that voice this is another exercise we do with my groups and their clients, simply naming that voice, like giving it a persona, a character, a uh, character, right? Yeah. Um, I call mine Wiley Cody. He's the, he, he's, he's the, <laughs> I can see him. Right. And he's the, he's the self doubter. And, and what's interesting is that he'll show up and, um, instead of like trying to push it away, like, man, I don't want to feel self-doubt right now. Just like, if you try to avoid it, right, that which you resist just persists. So instead, it's like inviting Wiley Cody in for tea. Like, hey, I just want to know that you're you're validated. Everything that you're doing, I see why you're doing this. Like, you want to keep us safe and what we're used to and where we can survive, right? Even if that's really uncomfortable. And, and so <clears throat> it's like validating that that part of us right? That's like, Oh, I appreciate you. Like, thank you for trying to protect us and keep us safe and familiar. What that like, ego loves familiarity, right? Yes. Cause it knows we can survive there. Yeah. Yet our soul is like, Hey, there's all this expansion we get to experience <clears throat> if we choose. And so then it's all of a sudden just validating that like the voice gets quieter. Wiley Cody's happy to take the back seat and then your higher self can drive again. And then it's like, then you start realizing, wow, I have a lot of these voices. Like you got a whole family in this car or spaceship or whatever you want to, that, that want to chime in and need attention. Right. <clears throat> so then when you take this work deeper into, um, the inner peace process that I teach, it's essentially finding where the root of that came from. Right. And, and, um, getting the opportunity to heal it at the source. And that's where, um, my work that, the inner work created the new reality and more dreams coming true and just accelerated manifestations for me. It was really like tapping into gold through this. We'll process. get into the We'll get into the inner peace process later. Cause I'm just definitely feeling like giving it a voice is so powerful. Like if people already, man, if people are, are feeling something here, like 
just take this one piece of gold and that is like give the protector a name mm -hmm. give him a playful name like wily e. coyote right i Ta think my, tasmanian devil my you know? name <laughs> might be like uh jojo chris <laughs> yes. jojo chris right so totally. but really you know what i was feeling and, and i think most of us can identify with this the voice of the protector or the one that says i'm too fat i'm not good enough what am i going to say i'm not going to make mm -hmm. it i'm going to look stupid on stage blah 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 mm -hmm. it's like it's like the incessant monkey mind it reminds me of the archetype of just the child, you know, like the child just wants yep. to be held. Like if your daughter's crying, you're not going to be like, why are you crying? <laughs> you're just going to hold Absolutely. her. So the, the real like emotional, spiritual maturity that you're talking about in, in simplistic terms, I feel like is, mm. Hey, can you hold yourself? Can you hold yourself yep. when you start to trip out and yep. you know, breath work is huge with that for me. I mean, we did some breathing before we dropped mm -hmm. in. I know you, you facilitate breath work as well. But giving it a name is a beautiful starting place. And then, and then from there, what's the next step on the journey from there? You know, you've given it a name. It's like, oh, hello, hello, Wiley e. Coyote <laughs> or hello, Jojo Chris. Um, do you just go right in tactically and hold yourself? I mean, there's a lot of nuance there to explore. Sure. So break it sure. down, man. Yeah. So, you know, um, it, it starts with like everybody knows this, this term like, oh, you, you got to just feel it to heal it. Right. We can intellectualize it. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I'll yeah. just feel it. And that makes sense to the mind. <clears throat> but how do we actually do that? And so um, I really dove deep into this and and um, was able to heal my own abandonment issues through this process. And it worked so well that that's why I simplified it, refined it down to an inner peace process that's really easy to implement and then you're empowered it's like batman with the utility belt this tool that you can continue to use and double down on whenever you're experiencing these curveballs in life or whenever you're experiencing tough emotions or feeling stuck anywhere in your life whether it's relationships money whether it's <clears throat> um you know stepping into creator consciousness over consumer and and so the process is actually really simple it's diving into where you're feeling stuck and then noticing where that shows up in your body, right? So like physically locating it somewhere. Yep. Yeah. And then that gives us clues. That gives us intel, right? That's tapping into the intelligence that's in each and every cell of our body. That's always um, finding alignment. It's always, it seeks harmony and seeks inner peace because that's our natural state. And so <clears throat> now you're giving attention there and then you tune into the emotion that's associated with that, right? And then with that emotion, we feel into that. And it's like turning on or like putting on lens of curiosity. So instead of dreading it or, um, you know, trying to run from it or stuff it, it's like actually, why is this energy here? And, and getting really curious with that. And then, then it becomes less scary in my experience. And then we're able to learn some of these golden and silver linings that lie underneath this. And that's where we can connect it to where that energy first started. Like what was the first time you experienced that kind of fear or the first time you experienced, experienced that kind of grief, right? And then there's a story to that, right? And then in that story, there's a part of you, whether it's Wile E. Coyote, whether it's um, your inner four-year-old and, and that, that inner part of us is still caught in this loop and created some belief systems there and some coping mechanisms because it didn't know how to deal with that emotion at that time, right? <clears throat> and those coping mechanisms, that story, those beliefs are what will continue to show up in our experience and our reality all the time. They'll just continue to show up, different characters, different, you know, people and pieces, but, um, they'll continue to show up until, and it's all happening for us to show us where the source of this is and which part of us needs that reparenting, like you mentioned. And so, um, it's an amazing process for connecting these dots, you know, and, and seeing how everything's intertwined. And then, you know, like in my experience, it was, um, my four-year-old was, he, he felt, so abandoned because um my parents got divorced and it was like the first time my mom left you know and I remember the color of lipstick she was wearing I remember the smell of her leather jacket and she told me she was leaving and I didn't know when I would see her again 
And so this is the woman I love the most, four years old, dealing with abandonment. Yeah. <clears throat> I didn't know, you know, how to deal with that level of sadness so or. Right. Right. Totally. And so um, sadness and anger, those were like the two emotions that um, created this story. Right. Like oh, I was abandoned, so I'm not good enough. Right. And then that belief system would carry out through my life. Right. <clears throat> and so would the repressed anger. And, and it was just fascinating to see like how many times looking back, like I would get triggered and each trigger was an opportunity to actually feel into that and express that and, and like learn constructive ways to channel that energy into something great instead of just avoiding it and having to resort to sex, drugs and rock and roll. Right. And so <clears throat> what's interesting is that, um, you know, for me, it would show up as like back in high school and college and stuff. I was life of the party. I was having fun. And anytime we would like drink alcohol every few months or season, it would be like these guys would come up and just start crap with me. You know, like I'm having a blast at the party. I don't want to fight. And yet these guys would come up and start shit. And so it was, um, you know, kind of the same story just played out. I had too much pride to back down. So, you know, I'd take the first punch, give the last nine or 10 and then get the hell out of Dodge before the cops show up. And that was like my pattern, right? Everybody has their patterns. And finally it was like, it took me till college when, you know, I got really drunk one night and ended up at a party. I got confronted by a bunch of guys and I was totally outnumbered. So we exchanged some words. I started leaving and got kicked or pushed in the back and went down uh, cement stairs. And so I woke up in the hospital and I had to literally sit with anger and revenge and all these emotions that I didn't want to feel. And so um, this, it was so intense and so visceral. I remember like I wanted revenge and I was so angry. I could barely even take it. And and yet it finally made me like pause and actually like there in the hospital bed and I actually had to sit and feel it instead of resorting to all these other, you know, alcohol and coping mechanisms. And in that something really um, amazing happened. I, I just, you know, it started, I started connecting these dots as to like where I was, where I originally was angry, angry and didn't get to express it. Right. Like in did, the hospital, didn't know bed. how to express it. Right. And so, um, that shifted so much for me because even that awareness alone that, you know, I'm going to parties drinking and anytime I'm harboring anger, that's going to come to the surface, even if I'm having a great time. And so anyone else harboring anger <clears throat> is going to, you know, be attracted to me via law of attraction and then mm -hmm. sparks fly. Right. And so it was just showing me what I get to feel and heal, right? And so, um, you know, back then I didn't have the same level of emotional intelligence, but I had enough to realize like, wow, I need to channel this energy of anger into something constructive. And that's when I got into boxing and, um, and even, even freaking dancing more and just movement in the body. Yeah. Like, like physical exertion was my medicine then for that. And it was beautiful because it, it was like channeling that energy that I used to think was so negative into something constructive that allowed me to like build empowerment within myself. And so, and I learned some golden nuggets sitting with the depths of anger. Yeah, that's right. Man, it's amazing emotion for a catalyst for change, right? It's like we see real clearly when we're experiencing anger what we're not willing to tolerate anymore. Ooh, the lesson right. continues to repeat <laughs> right. until you give yourself permission to feel it. But then, of course, mm -hmm. in order to give yourself permission, there's courage. Right. And in order to have courage, you have to have really support mm -hmm. either from yourself or from another. Yep. And everybody's born with a certain level of courage. It's mirrored epigenetically through their cells or maybe their parents model it for them. Mm -hmm. But there was something like that I heard from Caroline Mice and she was like, everyone comes in with a contract, like a soul contract. There's something about your soul contract, man, that allowed you to take these, these dark moments and use them for you. I don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, you know, yeah. Um, or maybe we spend our whole lives unraveling what that contract is. I'm not quite sure yet. I'm kind of sure. figuring it out too. Yeah. 
Um, but what, what do you think that is about your character, about like Charles Clay, the soul? Mm-hmm. You know, if you were to speak from your soul level, mm-hmm. why do you think you attracted those in? Because there are so many amazing lessons and blessings to learn, right? And so through this journey, it's allowing me to learn them the easy way and then help others do that as well and experience that for themselves. So then it's like when we get hit with a curveball in life or when we experience a storm of emotions, we realize, wow, there's actually something in this for me to learn. There's some gold and silver linings. So we put on that reticular activation, you know, that system, that phenomenon where we can start putting on our radar system for the solutions, the answers, some messages that we can receive about this. And so if you zoom in on each experience, like everybody's experienced this, like when you go to the depths of that, you learn something deeper about yourself and about your relationships and then, and then expand that out. It's like, cool. Actually, you look at every big challenge in your life and your biggest adversities have always led to something great, whether it's, um, building you who you are today, Every time. whether it's, you know, the lessons and the blessings you gain from it and get to share with others. And so knowing that and seeing the evidence of that and you're in each of our past allows us to like, not be so scared about the storms. And then when you're not so scared of the storms and the emotional turmoil and the challenges in life, then you can actually maintain a level of calmness through breath techniques through movement, through your practices that allow you to come back home and then pick out in the storm, like what's really important. Yeah. Like what's really needs my attention right now. It's most focused on. Yeah. The anxiety is the, you know, rumination on the future. And then the depression is rumination on the past. Mm-hmm. And in the middle, there's this like human being, man, woman, whoever, however you identify doing an amazing job. But yet for some reason we like, <laughs> it's almost like we drink from the river of forgetfulness. And I know I've mentioned this a few times mm-hmm. on the show, you know, the logos it's written in, in religious mm-hmm. texts. We come into this world with our contract and we on purpose drink from the river of forgetfulness because we want to forget how amazing we are, how, how we are the creator consciousness mm-hmm. that you talk about. And we come into the world and we learn through parental example that we're actually this consumer consciousness. Mm-hmm. And I love that because I haven't heard that those two things put together. Uh, when did that come through for you? What exactly um, is that? It sounds like it's, it's an amalgam of many different terms, Yeah, but it's like, it's beautifully stated because we either consume or we create. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it. Totally. It's huge. And just, just to zoom out um, even further, the whole collective right now, like with everything going on in the world, all the so-called chaos, We're consuming it's all fear. happening for us, right? Yeah. And you can choose... Are you going to keep consuming the fear, which is the information that you choose to put, give your attention to and your energy to. And so notice how that feels in your body. So I really commend everybody that's showing up and having the courage to dive into some of these emotions and learn from, you know, what they can from this inner journey right now, because that is actually helping heal the collective and amazing things are going to come from this like the whole world, like we are on a path for the golden age and in order for that transformation to occur, it's going to be uncomfortable at times. Right. And we're all experiencing that in our own way. So does the butterfly, you know, as it's melting caterpillar in the chrysalis before it can fly. Right. It turns into liquid. Right. It has to be how how uncomfortable would that be? (laughs) Right. And so tuning into the, the, choosing creator consciousness over consumer, it's like you begin to see how our society is so built around a consumer society. We've just been conditioned to consume, you know, whether it's pharmaceutical drugs for any problem that you have in the body, don't listen to your body. Like just take this pill, right? Here's in. And so, um, to, you know, the, drugs, alcohol, you name it. Everybody's got their thing right now. It's like smartphones. So addictive, right? So every time that we're giving away our attention to these things, these distractions, we're actually giving our power and our energy to them because where our attention goes, 
our energy flows, right? So this was a game changer for me because uh, I literally called it Pac-Man, the Pac-Man program, right? Was my over consumer. And he was like Frank the Tank, dude. He was ready to like, <clears throat> let's party, let's drink a ton, let's like eat as much sugar as we want. Like he's the one yeah. that's, and he's very persuasive sometimes. Oh, yeah. you know, Hedonism is fun. Yeah. And so that noticing the Pac-Man showing up when he wanted to just like be ravenous and just consume like all these things and then noticing the effects of that over time. I was like, man, this is steering me further from where I want to be, who I want to be and what I want to accomplish. And so it was like this coming to terms with myself, my truth of like, man, I have, I actually don't have healthy relationships with alcohol, with um, my phone, with, you know, social media. And so little by little, I went through this process, this inner peace process and, and went through this journey, connecting the dots and was able to witness as I metabolize this energy within my being that I'm no longer need because I'm gaining the lessons from it and the blessings. And then as that metabolizes, then it's like, whoo, you're feeling the same energy that creates planets flowing to you and through you. And you know that feeling, it's like, you're just super tapped in turned on yes. and like ready to rock and you can't contain that energy all in one body. It feels too good. So you want to share it. Right. And that's what, ins that's that inspired action that ensues more creation. Yeah. Right. Like I want to channel that into like, and that's sustainable. Yeah. Like, like inspired action is like a wellspring. Like it comes mm -hmm. from the ground naturally because mother earth has water inside of her and it just comes out because that's what she likes to do. She likes to give us water <laughs> and, and you like, um, there's so many different ways I could approach that. The, 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 the thing that I heard you say that resonated the most was like that sustainable fuel source where you're coming from inspiration and inspiration is like, it's a wellspring that could never be exhausted, but motivation, like being motivated. It's so interesting that, that myself and so many people can fall into the motivation trap. Like I'm going to be motivated. I'm going to motivate myself. And that's cool. If you want to like, um, climb a little section on a mountain or, or jump over a gap. Like you need to be motivated in those moments, but inspiration, how does inspiration uh, connect to the creator consciousness? And what are some of the pitfalls that bring people to the, to the consumer consciousness? Mm -hmm. uh, so many of them. I mean, just think about where your attention's going on a daily basis. You know, is it really going towards what you want to create this list of ideas and these things that you want to bring to the world before you die in this lifetime? How much energy and attention are you giving those, you know, or how, how much time are you spending tuning in to allow more of those to flow in? Right. And so when we come back to that natural state of inner peace, then we're in a receptive mode where we can receive that stream from mother Gaia of like amazing ideas of, you know, inspiration. And that's, what's cool is like that operating from that place is different than having to use a million mindset hacks to motivate yourself to, um, get your butt off the couch and actually like do something, which either way gets you there. Eventually. Um, I just prefer the inspired action approach simply because the quality of the energy at which I'm creating with is so much more, exciting and fun and like that whatever you're putting into it like if you're building a program and you're trying to just motivate yourself so much to do it and you have any like bit of scarcity or um you know you're desperate at all to like that it has to work out and all this stuff like even if it's one percent that's going to show in everything that you're creating yeah like that energy is yeah. perpetuating into the what you create lie. Right. It really doesn't. So by mm -hmm. noticing what's coming up and allowing your system to metabolize that, whatever's in the way of that inner peace, like that's where your time's spent really well in that moment so that you come back to that state of, cool, I'm back to home base. Now the ideas are flowing. Now I'm like super inspired and I know my next step. That's all I need to know. You know, I need to, I get to work on this right now. Boom. And that way, the quality of the energy going into it is so much higher. And, and people know that, like they feel that they sense that in whatever you're creating. And so it's, um, it's, it's fascinating. 
There's this, mm-hmm. there's this term, uh, stagnation, emotional stagnation. We talked about it, um, maybe three episodes ago with, with Bobby Vogel. She's an etheric medicine practitioner. So she does really deep healing work for people across the world. And she brought up this, this phrase, um, stagnant energy or dense energy. And what you're describing with like being a, you know, human on this earth, that's not just focused on consuming and being a victim. I think in those States we can get stagnant Mm -hmm. and, and we can get stuck, but gosh, it's interesting because we all can forget at times, like it's actually us that is choosing to be there. We can choose to not be there. Mm -hmm. And there's this power of choice that I've heard like Marcy Locke talk about and other people Mm -hmm. like the power of choice is yours. Just choose to be happy or just choose to be this. Mm -hmm. If love was a light switch, we would all flick it every day. Right. Like there's a, there's a deeper, more nuanced process Mm -hmm. to what you're talking about with the creator versus the consumer and, Mm -hmm. and really the, the self love quotient. Cause all roads with this dude lead to self love. Yep. I mean, that's it. I've had to walk that journey and I still will walk that journey until the day that I die. Just reminding myself, like you are amazing. You're doing such a great job. Like Mm -hmm. look what you're doing for other people. And, and it's, it's interesting because, and, and what I'd love for you to share, we tend to learn from men that, uh, use two emotions, anger and uh, maybe frustration. And mm-hmm. those are the only two. And that was kind of it. And, and there was never really room in that old school, like maybe in our father's, um, in our father's generation, there wasn't really any room for anything else. Mm-hmm. Like that's just what we were taught. And so I, w- I wonder if you could uh, unpack that a little bit for specifically for the men, you know, this applies to women as well, mm-hmm. but specifically for men who, um, maybe didn't have a father around, you know, which mm-hmm. is sadly the case for, for a lot of men. Right. Um, how do they go into that introspective process and, and how does that relate to all these things we're talking about? Yeah. So just taking a clear look at um, your coping mechanisms and what is blocking you from creating what it is you want to create and tapping into that natural state of peace. Like instead of like, Oh, just flip the happiness switch on. Cool. I'm positive. Everything's great. That can work to a degree, yet there's still these things that are needing your attention. And these things are these energies, the stagnant emotions, or I, I even call it like 3D debris. It's like, it's like <laughs> I love your terms, man. As we're, you have all these cool video game terms. Absolutely. As we're ascending <laughs> to, to 5D, you know, everybody's going through their internal ascension. There's these heavy you know, 3D debris that is, it's like needs to be seen and addressed and, and we get to learn from it. And, and that too will pass, you know, instead of carrying it around with you, you know, trying to avoid it. It's like this weight that just keeps tugging us down, you know, instead it's like, wow, why not just really go into it with an inner peace process and like discover what you can from it and then you can let the rest go, share the golden nuggets that you learned from it to help others on their journey. That completes that version of the hero's journey only to begin another. Yeah. And, and it's, um, you know, it allows us to come back to our nature, our nature of creative consciousness, you know, and then it's like, it's so much easier to, you know, share your gifts with the world when, when you address what's blocking you from that. And I don't want to placate people that are dealing with real stress because sometimes like financial responsibilities can, we've both had our journey with finance, Totally, you know, like I'm Mm -hmm. not immune to it at all. And, and I look back on that and I'm like, huh, what karma am I cleaning? Mm -hmm. And, and no BS, like this is taking me a long time to get to this place. Mm -hmm. What karma am I cleaning and how can I actually be grateful that I get to clean up my own karma so that I don't pass it on to my daughter, my son? whoever. Exactly. That's a big one. And honestly, I had to sit in my own medical room like you did on that one because I made some uh, poor choices with money and trusting people and trusting organizations and, and, you know, losing like tens of thousands of dollars and like, it's real. So there is something about the intelligent aspect that what you do and you help your clients and it's men and women. It's not like, it's not like only men work with you. I know you, you run a bunch of men's groups and Um, what is it, what is it about the being in that space that we need and is also uncomfortable? (laughs) Like we're there, the lesson is being served. It really sucks, but it's also really good. What, what exactly is that? You know, 
there one it's sitting in those uncomfortable um you know situations of like wow i'm getting really i'm getting hit hard with like how am i going to pay these bills or you know where is this going to come from and it's it's like a deep trust fall it's a deep trust fall it's like allowing you to come back to this deep understanding that we're fully supported, right? And then what'll show up is anywhere within yourself that's feeling unsupported. And that's where we get to bring our attention to, bring some love, attention, support to those parts of ourselves. Then they feel integrated again. Then we feel whole and complete again. And then some clarity can ensue as to, well, oh, well, this is what's going to help me get there. Or let me take an eagle eye perspective and see like, let's put together a game plan here. Right. And then it's like, cool. Now I know that I can get there doing this step-by-step plan that appeases the mind and gives the mind a job. And then we can operate from our heart space, which is beautiful. Cause then when these two are connected, the mind's a terrible master. But when we're operating from that heart space, it's like, not only can I do this, but Um, what I can create from this is in the best interest of all. It's a win-win-win situation for everybody involved. Win for you, win for me, win for Mother Gaia, you know, and then it's like, cool, you know, as I go through these challenges, then how can we help others and then create more universal abundance, right? And it's all about remembering that abundance comes from an infinite source within us. And so those are just a few of the golden silver linings that I've gone deep into in that uncomfortable crystallis of learning how to fly. You know, when you're being liquefied, mm -hmm. the last thing you're thinking about is the lesson. And I find that I'm curious how you feel about this. Mm -hmm. I find that, and this is why I really, it's the perfect time to bring it up in our conversation. There is so much spiritual bypassing in our world of like wellness, personal development, Mm -hmm and conscious media in general Mm -hmm. that I want you to please speak to this because the terms that you've used, I know you, I trust you and you've done the work and I understand these terms, but these terms can be used by people that have not embodied the work, but they have Mm -hmm. brilliant marketing, right? Like brilliant marketing. Um, I'm not going to name any names because I'm not here to slander people. Y'all can make up your own choice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You you can make up your own choice on that. But how, how do you navigate our world? of and and also how people might even find you right Mm -hmm. your programs your coaching Mm -hmm. what are the things to look for when seeking out someone for emotional intelligence spiritual development Mm -hmm. any kind of work on the self Mm -hmm. how would you describe that like what do you look for when you yourself look for a coach or when people look for you yeah um well i always tune into intuition it's, it's our own medicine that we're all gifted with. Sometimes it's harder to listen to than others, but intuitively you can navigate, notice what comes up on your radar. Okay, I want help with this. Like, I'm sick of this. I'm ready to change this aspect of my life, right? Then notice as those answers start showing up, like those puzzle pieces start filling in, you might notice um, now I'm hearing more information about... Um, how to get out of debt or whatever the issue is, right? And then then really tune in to the intelligence within your body and notice like, does this feel intuitively expansive? Like this is gonna help me on my path? Or does this feel like um, it's a little more contractive? Like it's not quite the path, like the way. Thanks for the information, but that's not quite it. Those little like um, maybes or doesn't quite feel aligned, those are really key components to pay attention to because then you're tapping into the intelligence of the body using your intuition medicine and it can steer you to all the right guides, the mentors, the, you know, um, and, and as you, you know, consume their information or feel their vibration, then you tune into that even more. And it's like, oh yeah, this person has some codes, that um, I could definitely use and could help me on my journey. And then if it's in full alignment, then have the courage to like step up and reach out to that person. You know, I've used the analogy of like intuition Mm -hmm. being a sword that cuts through all the bullshit 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so there's practices to sharpen it, right? Like how do, how do you, obviously drinking clean water, sleeping, practicing, thinking good thoughts, being around the right people, Mm -hmm. practicing emotional hygiene, Mm -hmm. you know, like all these tools are powerful. Absolutely. Um, but a lot of these tools, people can hear neck up and be like, all right, I'll make the spreadsheet, but they mm-hmm. never do it. Right. So th- there's something about this uh, bridge between knowing and doing that is my favorite thing to talk about mm-hmm. because it is always a learning curve for me. And I think all of us, let's be real, like we, you and I know a lot of things. I mean, we got like 80 plus years of wisdom in this room. Okay. Sure. But the, the, the application of our knowledge is really like the meat of emotional intelligence, mm-hmm. physical intelligence. So when you work with clients, how do you help them on that bridge? Like, how do you, how do you help them cross that gap? Yeah. Is it, is it loving? Is it accountability? Is it a combination of both? I mean, what's your, what's your sauce on that? It's definitely a combination. And what's great is, um, by getting really good at attuning to my, um, intuitive medicine that that helps me steer where to go with clients and and their needs. Right. Once I understand exactly where they're at, where they want to go, then, tap into my intuitive medicine. And the key to that has been um, coming back to these practices to regain energetic sovereignty. We talk a lot about sovereignty, but energetic sovereignty is like fully embodying each and every cell and every molecule and atom of your being with your unique life force energy. So that that means you get to take a look at like where you've been taking on other people's energy might be getting stomach aches from it, second chakra stuff, um, where you've been giving your power away and feeling like, you know, crawling up in a ball, you know, and then as you attune to this subtle energy body and learn these protective practices, you can literally create an auric field that is a healing sanctuary for you. And that's part of, you know, my good morning rituals that I share and, Um, my practice, my pillar that I keep coming back to so that um, I can tell when I'm, you know, been entered with or like feeling into other people's energy and like what's mine, what's theirs. And then using these practices to maintain that energetic sovereignty is like my home base. And so this is a lot of what I teach with my clients so that that can become their home base. And then with that, it's really beautiful to witness because then they're starting to source answers for themselves. And then they're starting to like choose their path more wisely on their own. And then they have these tools that I offer, like the inner peace process through that journey that they can then embody and use as needed to continue on that path of their highest and greatest creations. How'd you come up with this inner peace process? You know, it's been years of um, refinement and like really um, same thing, like using my intuitive medicine to um, both like healers, guides, um, mentors that that I've been called to. And then kind of like a buffet, like you, there's a lot of stuff that might not resonate with me, but then I take the things that do, I practice that until I embody it because it works. And then... And then I have like my version of that and I combined it and simplify it with everything else I've learned into a really, that's one of my gifts is being able to take what's really complex and break it down into simple, like the simplest form of easily digestible practices that you can come back to and create your pillar of, oh, this is home base. And then from here, it's easy to access my intuitive medicine access answers and clarity on where I want to go next. Is the inner peace process something that you give away as a gift or is it part of the program itself? So it's an eight week journey and, and i um, creating a group f- dynamic for that now, but so far it's been one-on-one work because yeah. it's a deep dive. Yes. Yeah, so you and, can't get inner peace in a day. <laughs> it takes it takes more than a day to get inner peace. Is that Every, what you're saying? Everything's possible, um, and even in, even in eight weeks, I'm sure, like you know, you can yeah. you can break off the top of the iceberg. But sure. you know, really, like I we talked about this before we recorded, man. And I, I'm gonna stand firm on this. Like I think asking how do I be peaceful 24 seven is the wrong question. Mm-hmm. It is just not an intelligent question. Right. I think how do I become more peaceful is a beautiful question Mm -hmm. because then there's not an expectation where I can potentially fall into a shame spiral if I'm not peaceful. Absolutely. What do you feel about that? 
Totally. And just, just like that reframe alone and in, in the inquiry is reminds us that, you know, the quality of the questions that we ask, you know, follows suit to the quality in our life. Mm -hmm. So ask better questions, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's one of your gifts, man. Ask good questions. Amazing. Amazing at that. So there's a big piece yeah. of that too. Cause I, I think so many of us are like, wow, when will the war on the world stop? When will our brothers and sisters stop fighting? When will the war inside of me stop? And it's like, well, hold mm -hmm. on. Like, why don't you ask, ask the other end of the question? That is, mm -hmm. why is that occurring in the first place? Mm -hmm. Instead of desiring the end, the finite of something, right. can we ask why it's occurring? And can we be curious about that? And I think, man, from, from my experience, this is an amalgam. It's, it's like, um, you know, holistic is a circle, right? Mm -hmm. Holistic living. And so there's so many things that feed into our capacity to think, our capacity to feel, um, and all of these things you, you talk about. Mm -hmm. But when you look back on your life and the, the challenges you've had, there has to have been one that really sticks out that made you have a choice point where you're like, okay, I'm either going to embody this loving awareness. I'm either going to embody mm -hmm. this observer aspect or not. Cause so many people, unfortunately, and you know, my heart goes out to uh, anybody who has, that has serious addictions. Yeah. It's not like they're bad people. Right. They just fall into a, a dark trap. Yep. So what is, do you have one of those that you could share with us? Like what's, what's oh, one, yeah. I mean, I'm, you probably have multiple, Many. but what, what's one that you've had where you're like, okay, this is really a choice point for me. Yeah. Um, they're all gifts. Um, this is, might be a bit of a long story, but um, what intuitively comes to mind, because it's Halloween today, and that's my dad's birthday, is my journey with my father. You know, it went from, like, he was really good at expressing anger and, and joy, so both ends of the spectrum. And, at least you got the joy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so through, you know, teenagehood, there wasn't a lot of, like, it was more butting heads than a lot of like hugs and I love yous, right? We hadn't developed that emotional intelligence yet. So fast forward, he got divorced. Um, and the second time, right? And this time I was off in college and, and I remember coming back um, each weekend that I could to just help him out. Like he, she took everything he had. He went bankrupt, like his business went under all these things. And so it was like, man, he, dad needs me now this time, you know? And so, um, I didn't realize at the time that like, that was such a huge bonding moment for us that really opened up, uh, a new level of, uh, love and admiration for one another. Cause I, without even knowing the term holding space, then I was able to hold space for him and like be there for him and, and hang out through that challenging part. And that is one of the greatest gifts. That's how we're all like puzzle pieces to this, you know, big puzzle helping each other along the way, remembering that um, we're not supposed to do this alone, you know. And then fast forward, I'll never forget the call when, you know, he shared with me, you know, I just got a call that the doctor said I have stage four cancer and that I have two months to live. And I remember pausing and choosing my words very wisely like before I reacted. And I said, Dad, do you want to beat this? Do you want to live? And he said, damn right I do. And I said, good. I took a breath and I said, don't listen to a word those doctors said. We're going to get you on the most amazing cancer curing, you know, every single thing like there's so many ways that cancer has been you know um we have from gerson institute throughout history they've been curing cancer in in different ways so we had green drinks we had an infrared sauna at his house we had taught him how to do coffee enemas i mean i was flying back like every time i needed to from san diego to washington roll up my sleeves and like okay let's dive in i would give him neurokinetic therapy tune-ups for his body um you know and then he'd be feeling better and we had a huge roller coaster ride like but all in all we turned two months into two years because there was one point where he went and saw the doctor and had zero you know on his cat scan like zero cancer and we were so stoked and like celebrated and and it was just amazing to 
to get to have that realize like that quality time with someone I loved and admired so much and get two extra years to share everything on my heart of how much he means to me, like how much, um, he's taught me. And, and, um, you know, if he would have listened to that doctor, who knows, Mm -hmm. he might've died two months later. And so getting to help him through that. And then one day like showing up and seeing him and realizing like, man, I'm not here to help him beat this anymore. Like his body's ready. He's, his soul's ready to move on. And, and that was one of the real heavy, you know, hitters for me of like, all right, I get to witness this entire journey and realize like everything I've learned along the way has all been to help him transfer on to energetic state again. And so I remember sitting there with him on his deathbed and, you know, his friend was singing us a song on the guitar and I just freaking crawl, just cried my eyes out. I just like, just like a full on ugly cry, like yeah. noticing myself in it and just giving full permission to like let go and, and deeper than I had before. And in the depths of that sadness, I found so much beauty. I was like the fact that we can just allow liquid emotion to flow from us you know, like a river and then be able to be witnessed in that by my dad as an expression to show how much I care about him. And I can't even remember the last time he saw me cry, you know? So that was super powerful. And, and then getting to be with him, you know, to the very end, like, um, I remember thinking like, man, this is why I've been called to plant medicines in the past and why I've been called to, um, a DMT journey and recognizing like what the experience is like outside of these human bodies, where we come from and where we go. And that it's this beautiful place of peace. It's like non-duality, non-resistance. It's amazing. And I got a glimpse of that. I experienced that. And I realized why I was called to that. And it scared the crap out of me at the time. (laughs) And so here I am holding my dad's hand, you know, and... And I got to share with him, you know, we love you so much. We'll always be with you. And there's no need to fight anymore. Where you're going is peaceful. And he took his last breath. You were right there with him. Yeah. What song was playing? You said there was a song. Um, It was a friend of his that had a guitar and played. He called it Let It Flow. And it it was, um, yeah, it was probably one of the, the best cries I've had. Well, let's send some love to your dad right now. Yeah. yeah. He's with us. Uh, on with All us. Hallows Day. Yeah. Today. It's his birthday. And um, mm. there's there's an honoring there. And I think every person that has had lost connected with your story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also just everyone that's ever known their father in any yeah. way, no matter what way it is. Yeah. I got this visual when you were talking. Um, and it was like you in the desert, actually. And it was like you, you had your cape blowing and um, I was having Paulo Coelho na- navigate you because mm-hmm. the alchemist, like mm-hmm. alchemy and, and having alchemy among your journey where you lose someone that mm-hmm. close, you know, it, it seems like for some they're chosen. It doesn't make it easier. Right. I'm not, I'm not negating sure. you in any way. What I, what I mean is um, what a powerful threshold for you to go through. Mm-hmm. Like, I just want to say, fuck yes. Not that you lost your father, but fuck yes, that you get to go through that and have this mindset because you could have chosen not to. Right. You could have, you know, gone down a path of anger or something. Or... It was such a gift, brother. It was a gift. It was, it was beautiful. Yeah. And, and I see life through an entirely different lens because I've been so close to death yeah. because I understand, you know, this is so finite it's such a short time that we get to enjoy the greatest technology on the planet these human bodies and share these experiences together in this form and in 
the greatest learning game that I know of <laughs> as a soul. And, yeah, um, yeah. and so let's get the most out of it. You know, yeah. Rip, just go tell your family, the ones you love, how much you love them. Like just, just do that one thing because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And, um, and that, that peace of mind, like understanding, seeing death that closely, um, it's actually beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's like, allows me to fully live life. I've heard this before from, from many people. Like there's, there's just a reality of what is at birth and at death. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've had many moments in, in journeys myself, um, two of them specifically where I died. And when I came back, I just, I had this one visual Charles of like hundreds of millions of pages of, in a book. And you and I are on like one mm. couple words on one of the pages. Mm-hmm. And there's like so many lineages that have come before us. There'll be so many that come with Sophia, mm-hmm. you know, and with Nova later on. Like, mm-hmm. isn't that just enough? Like, can we just make that enough? Yeah. I mean, it makes me want to cry just talking about it. Like, can that just be enough that, that we're here, you know, and that um, we're not always going to have the answers, Yep. you know, but the most important thing is like, can we enjoy it and can we step into love and be in our hearts as much as humanly possible? That Mm -hmm. is the magic. That is the quest. Yeah. We're all trying to make sense of it all. Well, maybe there's nothing to make sense of sometimes. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe the best thing we can do is like let go of trying to intellectualize the sense. Right. And, and that's the beautiful mystery that we get to enjoy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if we knew it all, if we knew all the answers, then what fun would it be? I don't think it'd be very fun at all. <laughs> be like then we could just the same movie. We could plan over. everything. <laughs> <laughs> we could just plan everything all the time. and We'd know exactly what's coming. Right. I didn't know I was going to move to Texas. If, totally. you, told, if you told me, total that, curveball for If me you told too. me I was going to be a father and move to Texas, I would yeah. have said, "Hell no!" What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah, um, when we moved here, it was like, "Woo, that's our highest excitement." Plot twist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah. So, but, so, so mm. these people have been on a beautiful journey with us, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and. And if they are interested in, in some of the things you've shared, mm-hmm. you know, like, like where do they begin with you? Is, is it, is it just simply reaching out to you? Do you have a, a different kind of talk about your offerings? Yeah. 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 So right now, um, really simply Monday mornings at 8 AM Pacific standard time, I host, um, the good morning rituals with the high vibe tribe and that is so much fun. It's amazing. Just st- putting those pillars, those stakes in the ground of energetic sovereignty and notice how that allows you to operate with more focus. And then the next case study that we're doing, um, we're enrolling for right now is the laser focus method. And this is for procrastinators that are stuck Mm -hmm. in time poverty and allows them to do more in less time with more focused energy in this Jedi training so that they can enjoy more of the free time more of the things they actually love. And it's incredible just the the results we've already seen from this. And so I'm excited to get this case study group together. And um, so if that interests people or the inner peace process, um, the one-on-one work with me and soon to be group group program, yeah. um, feel free to reach out Facebook, um, Instagram, and uh, email, all these ways work. Um, and then as well as, um, you know, just, um, I even have a website up Charles coach. So there's tons of ways to reach out. Cool. I just admire everybody where they're at on their journey right now. Um, this is like the most exciting time to be alive right now. 2020, the best year ever. That's why it's the hardest for transformation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're, we're in the liquefying stage. Yeah, exactly. On the caterpillar. I really mm-hmm. do. Th- I feel yep. that. I mean, people totally. are being liquefied. 75 million Americans. Totally. Bankrupt mm-hmm. or more. So I appreciate those that are, that have the courage to step up and ask for help and receive yeah. the help that's needed right now. Cause, um, we're not meant to do it alone. It's not, you know, the, the one man a lone wolf, you know, yeah. we've both been there and it's yeah. just a slow struggle of it's, that's not unnecessary. It's, yeah. it's also an illusion because if you look mm-hmm. at every parable ever, there's always two sides, night, dark, mm-hmm. black, white, you know, yin, yang. There's the story about the grandfather with his grandson. It's like, which wolf do you feed? Do you feed the courage wolf or do you feed the fear wolf? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I love, 
I love our conversations. We just happened to record one, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is even greater. They're always great. And um, as we as we step into this 2020, mm-hmm. 2021, you know, we had the year of the mirror where we looked at ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, two things, man. What are, you, what are you most excited about after the deep breath coming out of the transformation? Mm-hmm. And then two, how would you define living life well now? Mm-hmm. You know, you answer this question when you're in Encinitas almost two years ago. But what are you most excited about for 2021? And then also, how do you how do you define living life well? Like, how do you define wellness? Mm-hmm. 2021, I see, like, I'm a firm believer that world peace is entirely possible because it starts with inner peace. And so as more and more people are waking up to that's our home base, then it creates a ripple effect. It's already happening here. We see people thriving all around us. And it's a beautiful reflection of what's going on internally. So... 2021, I see we're stepping into this golden age that we get to create, creating heaven on earth. And it's possible right now, right here. Like we're already experiencing the flavor of that. And so everything moving forward has to be built on a foundation of what's in the greater good of all living beings, including us and mother earth. Yeah. Otherwise it will crumble just like a house of cards, like we're noticing now with all the corporations that are built on greed or even 1% of, you know, um, consumption over what's in the best interest of it. And so I'm excited about that because that's, that's the truth that I see, um, you know, right now. And then, um, and that can mean, you know, you pull up to a corner that you might see a homeless brother or sister and instead, now there's like a flourishing garden and they're stewards of that mm. and they're offering like amazing vegetables and fruit, you know, from that. That's, that's what I think is possible when we take better care of the mother, mother earth and, and our women in our lives, you know, may allow them to feel fully supported. And that's been a, a big wound and that's for another time. And, um, and then to live life fully right now, it's really simply, it's vacation vibration. Like we're here on vacation. Our souls in these human bodies experiencing like the f- cutting edge of learning, right? And w- and the more present you are in each moment, then the more we get to record these memories and these experiences in vivid HD. Like like 8K. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's what, you know, we get to share with, the Akashic records and, um, allow everybody to access it through cosmic Google. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the phrases, yeah. the video game analogies mm-hmm. and, the, and the terms you use, man. Um, so, so now as we march forward, like what is, what does that actually mean? Like if you had to define, maybe not even from the mind, forget mm-hmm. about defining this from your mind, mm-hmm. you know, defined from a head to heart connection. What, what does it truly mean to Charles Clay to live life? Well, from the heart space what's in the greatest good of everyone and lights you up it's just like the it's like always following my highest excitement and that's vacation vibration it's like that feeling you get when you're about to book a trip because you're due for some novelty right and you're gonna go to iceland and even just booking the trip you feel this like ignited energy in your body like oh my gosh this is gonna be so good even that is showing you what's possible, right? And so as we clear what's in the way, then your life can be lived in vacation vibration. And that's what I choose. It's creating the most epic moments in any situation. Even in the DMV, I've been to the closest place to hell and had like eight (laughs) people laughing there and created, you know, just with the power of intention and vacation vibration. I had so much fun in the DMV doing yoga and meditation and making people laugh that, um, you know, that shows that anything's possible. Wow. Great definition from the heart, because I I think about how many times I've asked that question. It's been over like 400 times I've asked that question Mm -hmm. and everyone's so unique, man. You're a unique blessing to the world. Thank you Mm -hmm. for being my friend. Thank you for making Texas such a great place. Yes. And, uh, until Charles Mm -hmm. and I see you again real soon, we're both wishing you love and wellness. Ciao.